welcome back. Those of you who are back, I hope the others will join in a minute. It is now my pleasure to introduce the panelists who will present success cases from the industries in a session entitled Sustainable Solutions in Infrastructure. Please welcome Dr. Alexander Arch, Business Manager, Hydropower CIS and Senior Project Manager at AFRI Switzerland, and Gabriel von Rickenbach, General Manager Americas at Geobrug AG. The panel discussion will be moderated by Bruno Alloy, Senior Consultant for South America at SGE. Welcome them with a warm applause. Thank you, Tatiana. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Tatiana. Thanks, everybody. It's very hard to come back from the coffee break, I know, but <laughs> let's start with the first question. I want uh, everybody to understand what is your footprint in Latin America. Let's start with Gabriel. Uh, can you tell a little bit more about Geobrook in uh, Latin America? Yeah, basically, Geobrook, we are delivering all the safety system for road construction, let's say rockfall barrier, debris flow barriers and some drapes about high tensile steel mesh. And for the footprint in Latin America, let's just start with Brazil. We started around 30 years ago. And we have some kind divided the whole region in some kind of bigger and smaller markets. When we see some kind of potential, which is good for Chiabrook, we just opened an Owen, an Owen company. It was the case in, in Mexico uh, three years ago. Last year, we added Peru in this case. We separated ourselves from the partner we had there. And the biggest entity where we, 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 where we produce as well is actually Chiabru Candina in, in Chile. And so for footprint, we are nearby in all the countries. And it's just, let's say, Uruguay and Paraguay, we are not yet there because the, the land is pretty flat. We are preferring mountains where we can install some kind of, of our systems. And this would be more or less a copy of the system we have here in the Alps. And this is basically where we are facing. And in Latin America, it's a lot about mining. We actually do, I would say, maybe 70% of our sales with the mining companies in South America. We are working on the road construction, but political-wise, it's sometimes a little bit strange when the government every four years change. And you have some other directions and uh, the mining business is much more, more predictable in the end. And that's why we strongly focus on, on that one. But then you, you operate under representatives and uh, on offices, right? It depends on the size of the market. Let's say when we see a small, when we enter, usually we go with a partner. Mm -hmm. And then how it was the case here in, in, in Peru, for example, we have been the last 12, 13 years with a partner. And last year, we decided to open a branch office in, in Peru just due to the size and the direct contact to the client. This is absolutely important because our thing to sell is not just like bread. Mm -hmm. You need to really be there, visit the client, go to the site, propose a solution. And when you then have a partner in between, the know-how is basically more or less lost. They will never be as good as, as we are in the end. And that's why we decided to cut off this tie and uh, go by ourselves. Exactly, yeah. And AFRI, what is uh, AFRI presence there in Latin America? Yeah, maybe AFRI is not that yet known as a name, but the name is, has a long heritage in Switzerland going back to 1895 with Electroart and Moto Columbus. We are a consulting company, engineering consulting company, doing business in all over the world. And we are more than 17,000 people and engineers. And we have a presence uh, in Latin America since the late 50s, early 60s, when we started energy as a mostly hydropower production in Peru and in Chile. And also on the other coast in Brazil, we started over there uh, in a sugar uh, cane process industry <clears throat> fabrication, and AFRI formerly also known as PERI, as one part of uh, the merger we did in 2019, is the first one in engineering of pulp and paper. So, and this is our biggest footprint in Brazil. Also, uh, apart from process industry, we have more than 1,000 engineers over there working uh, in, in, in these fields. 
And on the other part, we are present in Lima, Peru, which is our main hub for the whole entire Latin America. Uh, it's a region, we have an office in Mexico, Mexico DC, and in Santiago de Chile. And where our engineers mostly in the energy sector, also supporting the mining sector, but mostly in energy and process industries uh, are acting. Yes. Yeah, we see that both companies here have a very extent uh, uh, network of uh, representatives and local offices in, uh, in Latin America. We in SG, when we, uh, uh, when we, when we talk to the companies, when they want to inter internationalize, we, see, we always tell them they have to adapt their business model to whatever the local reality. How was the case of Geobrook? How did you have to adapt that into Latin America, being such a big company and being operating in different markets? Right? Yeah, usually, I would say the product itself, we did not have to adapt that much, but the way to provide the service. Usually, we are selling the, the steel structure, and then you have some kind of installation company doing this special work on hanging ropes. And here in Europe, you have a dozen companies who can do that professionally-wise. And in Latin America, there we had really to, to, to find some kind of, of companies who, who can do that. And then what we did, we did some kind of cooperation with Swiss, Swiss companies to train these guys. And then they established step by step the, the own professionals, the own, own team to, to install the, the system. Because in our case, in the end, a good installation is, is key. I mean, if, if you do the anchor not right and the system is going to fail, in the end, it will, the, the reputation of Geobrook will be, will be on fire. Because it will, they will say it's a, it's a Geobrook system which fall down and nobody is going to blame them, the, the bad construction company. Mm -hmm. And so this is some kind of a, a small change. And in some countries we started to install by ourselves so that we can really offer the whole package because of lack of, of companies which are capable to work on hanging ropes and drill the, the right things. And so I would say not really on the product we had to adapt a lot, but on the, on the way to offer the whole package. Yeah, was, that, was that taken easily inside the company or, or you had to struggle to try to change that from one, uh, one uh, system to the other? I think we are a pretty open-minded company. I think we have mm -hmm. pretty straightforward um, processes. And when we see that something is not working, we just go the other way. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. that's probably the advantage of a, a company which is not so big. I mean, that would not work probably at Novartis or Nestle, but on our face. We just try it, and if it's not working, just turn right or left, and then try another thing. And this thing is this agility we have still in, in Geobrook. Good. And for Afri, what do you think is the, the, the importance of this adaptation in Latin America? What did you guys have to do there? What do you think is main, uh, one of the main points there, in, uh, what is important there in Latin America? Yeah, from our experience, also from these decades, uh, Maybe one has to understand that the engineering business or the consultants business is, is a business of trust. And uh, so these trust building measures you can't do at long distance. No? So this, you have to be local, you have to be close to a client, and uh, you have to understand uh, also in our cases mostly the, the local regulations. So because every country is different there, and you have to be open-minded, no? <laughs> not uh, coming, let's say, with a strict mindset that that's my product, that's my style, and I will push it forward in that way, uh, as uh, we are doing it in our culture, let's say, in mid-Europe. Uh, you have to be open-minded, adaptive, because some things are working differently. Now. We are, uh, for instance, in different projects, bigger ones for infrastructure, water supply for the city of Lima. For instance, we're in contact with the Bolivian government for their hydro potential. So, and on the other hand, we are for constructive um, co construction companies <coughs> there as a Swiss company or, or let's say engineering brand uh, with the engineering education from Switzerland, no, brought to, 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 to Latin America with some expertises, we can gain in other different parts of the world. However, 
we can gain experiences technically wise, no? but the adaptation, I would say more, as I also lived uh, almost a decade now in Peru, and myself, uh, not really as an Austrian to, to adapt, but to be more open and to be close and understand the procedures and the heritages of the cultures. This is not only product selling, but also why there might be some suspicious uh, uh, thoughts behind, or might there be trust <coughs> behind or not. And this, I think, this shall be understood. And we adapt in that way that we have a close relationship, listen exactly uh, where are the worries of the clients, which are not always only technical uh, uh, grounded. No? There, I think, culture-wise, uh, for sure, uh, there's a warm, welcome culture in Latin America. All of you know that. <laughs> and uh, there is nothing to adapt so far. But in terms of being strict and uh, non-adaptive in some mindsets, uh, this might be tricky you know, to come up with products. And how do you think the Swiss executives that go to Latin America, how can they perform this way? How can they get closer to the culture, try to understand what the client needs there? Basically, what we were facing, as you can imagine, in engineering projects, you have these standards, SCI in Switzerland, mm -hmm. with the standards in Latin America. But apart from the standards, you have also the norms, regulations you have to fulfill. And the governmental institution also, maybe when we talk about opportunities, we talk about green mining, we talk about what we are doing, waste to energy. We are, so different things where regulations are not yet in place. There uh, you have, uh, let's do, be with a long breath, <laughs> make all these discussions to come to a fruitful end as a, in, that, in that sense that you don't have to expect, as a, um, let's say, the decision in the next minute. Uh, that what we learned, and uh, this, you can only do this, uh, let's say, in a close collaboration and uh, being close to the clients over there. And so it, it goes again together with what uh, Gabriel said about the, part, the local partners and constructing this bridge with the local partner, which is key for it, yeah, right? Correct. Great, great. Uh, uh, I have one question here for Gabriel. You, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, one uh, important implementation that Gilbrook did in the region, which was uh, you're producing locally. Uh, you have a facility in Chile. We want, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this experience and why did you uh, uh, decide to produce locally and which challenges did you face there? Yeah, the challenge is probably Be honest, just please. let it out. I mean, <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, actually, we we had the luck that we got some got a good client in Chile, and then the demand was so high that all production side of Chile had to supply for Chile, and then on some point we just decided instead of having a big stock there to supply to this mining client, we just opened a factory. In my eyes, it's a complete other story to produce in Latin America than just import and resell. This is a complete other level. I mean, then it comes about education of people, then comes about the reliability that the workers show up in the morning, that, that when you want to have a 24-7 production there, then you face really a lot of challenges. I think I got gray hair just because of that, honestly. But in the end, I mean, now it's working. I think all even the all the guys in Chile, the Chile Candino guys, they're probably more proud than I am about the production. And uh, but in the end, it's really it's um it's uh it's challenging to to produce in, in in Latin America. I'm not I do not have experience about other other countries to produce. It's just just talking about Chile, because yeah. of course I mean Chile does not has in this case does not have a culture of production. In Mexico, for example, you have a lot of automotive industries. You have a lot of engineers who know how to handle the things. And in Chile, we had to really to start nearby from scratch. I mean, now we have an absolutely amazing team, but we had to do some changes and retraining. And of course, I, I learned years ago a polymechanic, and then we had this Fachkundebuch Metal, this Libro, and then I had to traduce it to Spanish <laughs> and give every Friday afternoon to the operator some training. But I hope it worked. I think... Um, 
Yeah, but this is of, part, it's part of, of the condition of being there as well, that you have to yes, it somehow is, train it is, it is, it is. Uh, uh, the people into these uh, capabilities that you're looking for. It, yeah. And what we're trying now is that we try to adapt the Swiss dual, dual education system on a smaller scale, that we have some kind of a local institution which the, the guys are going to school and then they come one or two years to us to work. And this is, in my opinion, for Swiss economy, this is our backbone, this dual education system. This is absolutely key. I mean, sometimes I felt in Latin America that when a guy goes to buy a hammer in the, in the shop floor, he's already a Schlosser. And so, I mean, <laughs> it's just, we do three years or four years four years uh, apprenticeship here. And there it's somehow just learning on the fly. And so this was the thing which I personally struggled the most. That I had guys who cannot even, or were not able to, to use a caliper, for example. Was, how is this possible? It's things like that. The, but the thing we, we implemented a good good structure together with, with the team in, in Chile. And now they need to go through this internal training and I think we got them on speed and now, yeah, as I said, we are pretty proud that we we managed it and together as well with Ignacio who's sitting down on the back, I think he helped a lot to get we, we hear a good some, production. Uh, yeah, we hear sometimes the companies complaining about this uh, these difficulties that they found in uh, in Latin and uh, and there is a there is this perception that some somehow in some certain areas the, the region is lagging behind. But there, are also, uh, uh, but there are also other things, on the other hand, that we can see that the region is really developing. Uh, uh, Alexander, you, we talked a little bit about this before. Uh, where do you think that uh, Latin America is really uh, 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 on the forefront uh, and have state-of-the-art solutions that we can, uh, the Swiss companies can profit from it as well? I think from, <clears throat> from our own experience and maybe taking a bit the way from 2005 up to now, 15 years, when, when, when Facebook, Google, and all this took off, most of uh, the companies, or let's say, uh, in the European or Western, let's say, North American, European style, step from homepage to then adapt to LinkedIn and all these social media, which uh, in some organizations also, for us, okay, for the people, how to uh, adapt uh, to these uh, new medias uh, took some quite of quite of time, no? as we have seen that the openness to new technologies and also just to jump no? from non home page to directly LinkedIn mm -hmm. or doing the business just on Facebook, as so for smaller companies. This kind of mindset that you are open and, and open, have an open spirit to also adapt uh, different new technologies, which we in the engineering also could see. Because if it's going, uh, if you're talking about the digitalization, what we have done in, in Peru, for instance, uh, almost uh, six years ago was a complete, uh, let's say, laser scanning of tunnels and. Uh, Laser scan and based on that, the, the let's say security assessment of the tunnels, which was just in phase here in Europe to maybe introduce no, per se, kind of uh, some 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 special companies and also the translation from complete uh, industry sectors with tubes with it is for a, a painting fabrication company in Peru where we did the whole laser scanning and just trans translated it no, uh, to, to a complete 3D model and adapted the 3D model and on the fly it was adapted on the construction side. This kind of openness and flexibility, uh, this you can find in Latin America and also with the clients. No? I think this uh, also in, in Europe it's a bit harder no? uh, that it's uh, that flexible uh, in that sense, and this I think uh, I took myself uh, also from Latin America that this is a, a good thing uh, to, to take over. No? And also maybe just one comment uh, regarding education and uh, what I think what should be the perception that 
there is a quite good education in, in some states, if you talk from Lima, from Chile, or in Mexico, also from Venezuela, there are, so in the engineering sector, there are really good education. There is this, a high-level education, which but the people are rare to find. No? This, this, uh, this is a bit the lack. No? So if, if talking about uh, the uh, Universidad de Ingeniería in, 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 in Peru, okay, where 2,000 people want to attend, not just 100, 200 can <laughs> come into, so this, <laughs> it's a bit the problem. It's not, it's a, the education itself is good, but the, the amount no, of... But did you, uh, did you find difficult to find this kind of professionals? Uh, yeah. Networking. Networking, so it's, you have one good, uh, let's say, company knowing what they do. They have the right people. You have one good engineer and his friends. And so this is working in, uh, let's say, in Mexico the same way as in Peru, the same way in Chile. It's, just, it's networking. So this, and the base of all this is trust. Let's go a little bit deeper into the infrastructure self, uh, infrastructure sector itself. Uh, um, Gabriel, what do you think of the outlook for the region? Can the Swiss companies engage in this market? And how? Yes, I think absolutely. What worries me a lot is um, the big Chinese influence, honestly. If I'm just be blunt, I mean, what they did the last few years, that's just impressive. What kind of things they got as contract, what kind of companies they both. And there we, as a Swiss company, we need really to reinvent ourselves, how we stay in contact. Because usually they bring whatever from China directly and they build the road and then it's somehow pretty hard to sell their new product. This is gonna be a challenge in the future. But I'm still thinking we have some, some sweet spots to, to stay. I mean, if we are agile, if we are producing local, I think this is going to be a key that you select in a production company. You select some spots where you're going to produce because in the end it helps that all the containers got so expensive. I mean, just as an example, we paid before $4,000 and the, last, the highest price we got last year was $24,000 import from China to, to Chile. And this, there I see some, some options that we really could, with local production, some lean setup, still be in the game. And of course, then deliver faster and, and, and yeah, on time. But it's, yeah, it's so impressive when you see all these investments by, the, by our Chinese friends, actually. This is a... <laughs> Unfortunately, talk to about do. China, it's like yeah, this big. And uh, uh, do you think, uh, um, Alexander, that uh, this also has an impact uh, uh, in, uh, in can Latin America infrastructure be more green? Do you think that our USPs in the region can use as a being used as a differentiation factor in regarding this competition? Yeah, for sure. Because when it comes to uh, nature and when it comes to environmental thing, things or, uh, let's say, habits, uh, although some uh, pictures might not tell it, but uh, so in my opinion and my, so in our perception also in all our projects, there is high expected expectations regarding a sustainable and more sustainable uh, process industry. This starts with mining companies we're working with. They are um, heading towards really a, a self-sustaining uh, uh, power generation, no? auto-sustainable, as I mean, auto-sustainable. And this is coming from uh, mostly solar power, no? and also, but in Chile also what is a big topic is waste to energy. And all these kind of movements towards really green mining and uh, being more in the renewable energy sector, which in the second row uh, also makes uh, the productive sector more attractive, uh, for sure will bring also the opportunities and for sure we'll, there we see uh, the prospects, not only on, on, in the energy sector, but one I think obvious and, and, and also uh, I have to underline your, your words, that's right. We are seeing it not only in the small sector, let's say, or, or in the commodities, but also in the big 
idle power plants which are built or gas power plants or infrastructure, roads, tunnels and, and highways, where Chinese capital no, is brought <coughs> to it at really no cost, no? <laughs> it's, uh, but with, in, with the entire package. But the part what we are now seeing also in, 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 in the development uh, of the entire world is that this step stone coming from only primary product to secondary products, uh, this will uh, surely accelerate. And this is valid for uh, most of the countries as a productive country from the mining sector uh, mm -hmm. uh, and also in the uh, food and pharma. Because the other big issue what we can see and also not issue but the water scarcity or the climate change also already affecting hydrologically different parts in Latin America, some uh, uh, northern, in the northern part, maybe in 20 years, um, they may be a bit more lucky no, than the, in the southern part, because they will get a little bit more rain. Uh, but the whole agricultural sector, which is also a big one uh, in, in terms of uh, Colombia, Peru, and uh, also Chile, uh, will also face these uh, questions regarding water for uh, drinking water, water for irrigation, water for mining, which already are, are conflicts or um, conflict or discussions over there. And there with solar, desinhalation, and all the other, let's say, higher technologies, for sure, uh, we see uh, a strong growth and a strong position for Latin America. But do you think our competition, are they, are they in the same level offering this kind of sustainable solutions or than the Swiss companies? Yes, for sure. I think st still in that sense, uh, that's the possibilities for the Swiss companies. No? to put in their uh, the valuable uh, high education and higher experience no? in that sense, which is lacking no? so in some parts. And this is, uh, for me, uh, as a win-win situation as in the economies uh, for both for Switzerland and for the Latin American countries. And Gabriel, how do you see the sustainable question also in your business there in Latin America? Yeah, we are pointing strongly on that one, mm -hmm. about carbon footprint and all this stuff we are doing. What we see probably needs a little bit more education in Chile or in Chile or in South America because what we face, everybody's talking about that, sustainability. And then we have some big clients for to send some kind of questionnaire and all this stuff. And in the end, he's going to buy the cheapest thing. And so this match is not, not, it's not matching up, but we have to follow this, this path about green mining and all this stuff and then do in parallel influence the, the legislation or the, the, the rules so that the mining company has to, to follow that one. But the reality by today is everybody's talking about that, but then cheap, cheap, and yeah, you're out. This is like the way I see it. But I'm convinced that we can, if we go this path, that's the right thing. And uh, if there's a company trying to enter Latin America for the first time, what? Uh, what advice would you give them, Gabriel, now? Now you have this experience there. Yeah, it depends probably on, on the company itself, what kind of thing they want to do. But I would just focus on one market, pick out. We have still, in our case, some markets which are not so good. We are trying to get them flying. But pick out one market and then go to the region, then visit as many as other companies as you can and then just talk to the guys and get a feeling and never go with the first partner you have. You need to see a lot and then I always say if, if the gut feeling is not good, don't do it, but that's probably just my judgment. Uh, but there is not, not a standard recipe and what I say in the end, everything stays and falls with the people you have there. I mean, we have, I have absolutely amazing people in, in South America, so my life is easy in the end. <laughs> uh, I'll repeat the question for you, Alexander, but in the other way, what would you do differently in, in Latin America if you had the chance to go there for the first time? Oof. If you're a good question, because we really had successful decades. <laughs> uh, but uh, turning it around a bit in that sense that Maybe the 
long breath of a company, no? you should not underestimate. And in some, maybe okay, in some occasions, no? you have really to have the, uh, let's say, the patience and the confidence and the long breath no? uh, mm -hmm. to take opportunities. Our, uh, maybe okay, in our case, it's a bit special because no? we are dealing with infrastructure projects of, yeah, various millions no? and billions of investments and this is not sold or let's say done in, in one to the other day. No? There are lots of implications. But anyhow, also with, uh, therefore I'm, 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 I'm more than once uh, most emphasizing in the uh, word of trust no? uh, to underline this, uh, to really be open-hearted and open-minded for this trust no? which with the long breath <laughs> will turn out to success, not what we have seen. No? And plans for the future, both of you? What's the outlook for the region? Yeah, for us, we are quite, so we have quite a prosperous outlook. So if talking about Brazil, we are growing in, in amazingly in the embarkment taken and the process, uh, process industry sector, which currently we have opened also uh, one sector in, in Chile for that. Which uh, yeah, is going up like crazy now because the, the engineering demand right now worldwide is really high, and capacities and capable people, uh, not only as a, as a specialized technician, but looking a bit on the whole picture no, and understanding the whole picture are, are always a bit, bit rare. No? And there we see as a, a global company uh, lots of opportunities, and also for sure. I'm a hydropower guy, no? so okay, gas prices <laughs> also <laughs> will facilitate uh, our business and also PV and as a solar, wind, all these renewable energies that will, we will see a lot of investments and the potential uh, talking about uh, north of Chile, south of Peru, uh, hydro potential in Colombia, talking about the potential of Bolivia and other, so still, so we are quite prosperous. It's good to hear that. Gabriel? Uh, from our side, probably that we can do all the products of Chiebrook in Chile, just get the, the production bigger. Right now we are producing one, one product actually, but I would love to have everything done in Chile, like I would say copy of the, the factory in the United States, so that we can really have a hub in Chile then serve for Peru, for Colombia, for Ecuador. And then of course my big vision is that we can sell and market any kind of product, starting from racetrack barriers then to fish farming and geohazard and all, all these products we have. So that would be a big step because now it's pretty focused on mining. So so we have still some other product, product things to sell. And so this would be a, a vision. And do much more local because now we still import a lot, like searching local suppliers and building up the supply chain locally, this would be a, a, a vision. How was the, the name? De, deglobalization or deglobalization. something? Deglobalization. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm not the only one doing questions, so I want to open to the public. If, you want, if anyone has any questions for our guest here. Don't be shy. Hello. Yeah. Um, well, it's maybe a funny question. Um, both of you, uh, well, Gabriel is Swiss. I don't know, uh, Dr. Alexander, if you are Swiss also. Austrian. Austrian. Um, but um, it is clear um, Swiss engineering is, is uh, like given that that is bringing um, know-how to Latin America, right? I mean, I, my impression, the, the biggest um, opportunity for Swiss companies is bringing know-how to Latin America because the innovation we have in Switzerland and uh, is, is quite of much easier to bring. Um, it is certainly the mining, as you mentioned, uh, has a lot of opportunities. And um, Latin America is, is an area full of opportunities. That's what I like. You can come be an uh, entrepreneur and initiate something from scratch. 
in comparison with Switzerland, that everything is perfect on, and if you want to initiate a business, you have to be 120% better than the other ones. That's, that's much more difficult. Now, um, you bring a lot of know-how to Latin America. Um, people is open to learn, as you mentioned. Uh, you teach the other ones how to do the things. That's very nice. But my question now is, both of you, what have you learned from Latin America uh, business and what you could say to the Swiss uh, companies? Uh, that's why I learned from Latin America that I can share with the Swiss company. Yeah, in, in my eyes, living a few years in Latin America, on some things I'm not so Swiss anymore. I mean, <laughs> I'm always late now. This was impossible like uh, five years ago. But in the end, I'm not sure if it's really bad. I mean, it's just uh, the way it is. We are just, uh, I mean, if you really want to insist on your Swiss way in South America, I mean, I think you get crazy. Because you need to adapt to the local behaviors and, and do. And I'm not sure if it is, is this a thing I've learned, but this is just how I adapted to, to get more relaxed, actually. <laughs> I was much more strict before, and now, yeah, OK. I'm not so perfect anymore. It's like, OK, you can do it that way as well. I learned flexibility. Let's flexibility, put it that way. Yeah, I think that's, that's the word, flexibility. Yeah, yeah I would, would fully underline this. <laughs> Yeah. The flexibility of doing things, finding solutions in another way, and uh, on all levels, this was funny to me to learn. Uh, I had really the opportunity to, to have this with the engineers, with uh, Junta of Irrigantes, with uh, politicians, with finance ministers, but the flexibility to find solutions uh, in, a, in a quick way, this, I think, uh, Because you're also dealing with a very instable environment as well whereas here in Switzerland is more stable, so there you have to adapt more quickly. Maybe this uh, might be the perception as a, in some sort of politician, as a political yeah. system. So, uh, okay, there are no, no discussions, as I think no dis discussions on that, but what I formally uh, also uh, mentioned, this, this open-minded, no? Not uh, just as a stick to the stick to the rule, stick to the rule, which is much more translated as flexibility. Huh? This gives you also uh, opportunity. No? So this is maybe from the Chinese one, the word risk and uh, uh, chance. No? Yeah. This is the same word. No? Yeah. This, is, this, this is a bit the uh, enthusiasm which we might no? adapt. No? Okay. Any other question? Dr. Mel? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the key objective of the group told us that uh, we need uh, uh, working with the mining companies who are different from construction project authorities because political authorities will change you know, every four years or so. So I'm going to want to ask you, Astrid, uh, uh, you have been certainly confronted with a difficult situation being faced in a number of countries. Mm -hmm. And the question now is to which extent uh, can you uh, get some uh, insurances, insurance from insurance companies or from the Swiss export uh, guarantee in order to uh, get paid in case that uh, the, uh, uh, the government that, uh, or an energy company that uh, gave you a contract at the end of the day uh, is not paying you. Yeah, oof, <laughs> tricky, tricky question. And that's okay. We are, uh, uh, the bigger the company, the, the easier it is. No? Let's say in that way, as, as we are seventeen uh, thousand engineer uh, or with, uh, let's say also EPCM contract, which we in our case, if doing EPCM, meaning okay, we are really buying things and uh, handling uh, this for the client. And doing also the management, we do uh, certain uh, special contracts or special securities over there, also for 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 those uh, bigger contracts. But as far as now, uh, for these big governmental uh, contracts, 
there uh, we faced difficulties also with payments as well in, in, in the last decades, that's, that's true. Uh, but on the other hand, it's, it's a private risk business where uh, uh, some, some state in, in insurances are um, not stepping in uh, in that sense. No? So we have uh, lower, no? our, our, uh, we are covered in that sense for our responsibilities, but when it, gets, when it comes to business, then uh, it's, it's a business decision to do or not to do, no? trust or not to do. Another question? Hello, I'm Adriano from Switzerland Global Enterprise. Thank you so much for the panel discussion. I have a question to, to Gabriel. Uh, the fact that they're now producing in Chile, it means also maybe sourcing locally, using a high content of renewable energy, and not having to ship uh, many components and, and, and also finalize products from, from one continent to the other. My question is, uh, if and how are you promoting this eventually to, to, to tackle the, the, the demand in Chile more? Uh, less carbon footprint um, material, and if you see other companies now, especially now, looking into Latin America, given the fact that eventually energy uh, is available, uh, high content of uh, renewable energy as well with hydropower, so how, how do you promote this in your own company if you see other companies also being uh, influenced by, by, by this nowadays? Yeah, about carbon footprint, we just made recently some kind of analysis what it means to ship it from Switzerland to Chile or to from China to Chile or produce it locally. In our case, about the steel products, it was surprisingly not a that much big difference because the shipment in comparison to the steel production or to or to 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 the shot crete they use in the tunnel is really small part. But we we try that way. And then what we think about if you construct tunnels, for example. We like to go in the direction that with our solution it can reduce the the thickness of the short grid. This would be a thing which has a big impact. Because this this produces a lot of thing. But as we saw the the, the values about the scope one to scope three CO two uh, footprint, it's not a huge difference whether you produce it in, in Chengdu in China or in Rancagua. So it was surprising for me, but it is like that. And so we need to find other ways to promote this thing that with our solution, you can really make make a, a tunnel with less shot grid. And there we gain. But uh, for that one, we, we actually, in our plant in Rancagua, we made some kind of a mining technology center, we call it. And there we invite all the, the clients. We have cooperations with University of Chile, with some other universities where they're coming to do some master students or some PhDs. And then in our test facility, they're testing some new setups for, for the ground support in this case. And with this this link, we hope as well to influence the professor who is going to specify our solution in other minds. Uh, but yeah, as I said, the uh, difference, sometimes you read the research, you spot where, how, how do you promote it? Yeah, I think that uh, these two examples of companies are very interesting for us because when you see when all the chambers were here, they're talking about the opportunities in infrastructure. And these are two good examples of how Swiss companies can uh, profit from all the opportunities that Latin America offer. I would like to thank you both for the participation and thanks You're everybody. Welcome. Thank you, let's come. Thank you very much to our two panelists, Dr. Alexander Arch and Gabriel von Rickenbach, for the readiness to share with us your compelling business cases, also the outlook, the potential, and the learnings. It was very interesting. And thank you, Bruno, for your competent moderation. Another round of applause, please, while we give you your little <laughs> gifts. Now, as we know, unemployment and giving young people a professional perspective are enormous challenges in Latin America and elsewhere. The last session of this afternoon is entitled The New Social Contract for Latin America's Working World. 
I'm delighted to welcome on stage our speaker, Bettina Schaller-Bossert, President of the World Employment Confederation. Thank you so much, uh, Tatiana. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Gabriela. She left, but what a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, and what a pleasure to be addressing you now after a packed afternoon full of really wonderful insights. It is really both a professional but also a personal pleasure for me to be here. Porque creenseleo o no, pero yo pasé los primeros seis años de mi vida en América Latina, entre Perú y Guatemala, hija de un padre diplomático, por supuesto, diplomático suizo. Y de hecho, mucha gente me pregunta, ¿y cómo es que soy tan alta? Y siempre digo, pues... Será el árbol de mango y de aguacate que teníamos en el jardín, sobre todo en Guatemala. Eh, lo cierto es que tengo una hermana que nació en 1976. Estaba papá en Guatemala, ella nació en El Salvador por el terremoto entonces. Eh, o sea que recuerdos muy intensos para nosotros como familia. Y por cierto, mi corazón en esta región. Now I could tell you, of course, uh, and I would love to tell you much more, but I'm here to talk about, and it's a topic that's been brought up quite a bit today. It's the people topic, right? It's the world of work topic. So World Employment Confederation is the uh, federation that represents the sector of jobs, of private employment services companies. It is a confederation that is headquartered in Brussels, now, I happen to live in Zurich because uh, I am also active for one of the main members of World Employment Confederation, that is the ADECO Group, a Swiss-based company, which also operates in Latin America. The other global national members of World Employment Confederation are Randstad, Manpower, Recruit, you might have heard these companies. But actually, it's many more companies active in that space of sourcing, matching, uh, recruiting, um, headhunting, but also training, of course, outsourcing, outplacement. Again, everything that has to do with people in the world of work and companies in the world of work. Now, World Employment Confederation is active in, in Latin America. And I'm actually very proud because since I have taken over the presidency, we've had this focus on Latin America. And I will now make the trip to Sao Paulo early uh, October, in a month's time, uh, because we will be relaunching the World Employment Confederation Latin America chapter, uh, knowing of, well, the relevance of uh, the world of work, of course, and the relevance of having a very structured approach to solutions that produce, if I may say, well-regulated labor markets. I will also be in Mexico, where I was invited to join uh, the celebrations of uh, the AMECH, so the Mexican member in Mexico. They have been active there for 20 years. So as you can see, it's a sector also in other countries. We're talking Argentina, Peru, Colombia. We're talking uh, uh, Chile as well, which we've heard today. Uh, and we've been there for quite some years. So, I am delighted to be here, and I thought as I was preparing today, I need to take this higher even, all these mangoes, um, that I'd like to take you on a journey. And the journey really, imagine, is just as if, you know, you fasten your seatbelt, you get on a plane. Um, it's going to be a quick one. We're going to have to, it's one of those half an hour flights, maybe, if I manage a bit less, right? Um, and, and I was thinking about that, and it reminded me of, uh, when I was in Argentina in 2018 for the uh, B or G20 labor ministers meeting, uh, which took place in Mendoza, four days there. And I, I visited six bodegas, by the way, so uh, I have quite a memory of that time. Uh, and then, of course, so flew from Mendoza then to Santiago de Chile, so over, you know, the Andes, of course. So what I will do with you today is exactly that. We're going to take off. And I hope it's going to be an interesting uh, journey as you look out the window. You're going to see some peaks, some ideas. I will give you some snippets. Uh, of course, there are deep valleys behind uh, all those statements. Um, and you'll be very welcome to contact me after this, of course, uh, to know more. Now, um, the new social contract for 
uh, Latin America. And again, it's about jobs, it's about people, it's about work. I wanted to first pick up the fact that, of course, and we know it, it's a very diverse region, no country is the same. There are specificities, there's different political and economic environments. But when it comes to the world of work, there are common denominators. So let me spend a little bit of the time still in, in, as we climb on those common denominators. First of all, dear friends, it's still a plague because in all of these countries, the level of informality, so of people who are not in a formal working relationship, are not in a situation to have a work contract that gives them security, that gives them access to uh, safety, to benefits, to training, access to pensions is far too high. The percentage is these days above the average of the levels of informality in the world, the average in the world is 60%. In the world, 60% of people do not have a work contract. In Latin America, we are above this average. So the necessity, again, to have measures in a country to address that, I think, is undisputed. In all of the countries in the region, we have amazing young people who every year are ready to hit the labor market with their passion, with their dreams, with their energy, with their talent. But the labor markets are not built to welcome them. That needs to be addressed. In all of these countries, we've got fantastic women who are ready to contribute and to um, make these economies uh, thrive. Again, the labor markets are not built in a way where they welcome the women the way they should. Now, there was COVID. I'll just mention here a few things. Clearly, COVID brought the changes, and that's not only Latin America, that's all over the world, but also in Latin America. Changes that relate to those needs to re and upskill. So those people who have talents already, but also others, need to be now prepared to what COVID has brought, which is uh, new ways of working, of course, and which is uh, meeting the demands of digitalization as well. Two more things. One, um, what we see all over, and again, that's all over the world, but also in Latin America, the need for flexibility and the reality that flexibility these days is part of this world of work. But again, most labor markets, we, when you say flexibility, then policymakers start to cringe and they start to think that the devil is arriving. And actually for us as an industry who represent flexibility, that's obviously one of the, the great challenges there. Um, and then, as I said, what really combines everybody and brings them together is that absolute need to um, um, allow new ways of working. We call it the diverse forms of work. So the recognition that there is not only one employment relationship, which is the one between a company and an employee, but there's many different ways that people these days want to be active and want to earn a living and want to contribute, but there are not enough ways that governments allow for those diverse forms of work. So we as a sector, as you can imagine, are very active in you know, promoting all these elements that should allow for better regulated labor markets. And now I'd like to take you on another journey, because we were also part of a fantastic initiative by the International Labour Organization, the ILO, which is the United Nations Organization for Jobs, for Work, headquartered in Geneva, as you know. The ILO in 2019 knew that it would celebrate its centenary. The centenary, 100 years of ILO, which also means, by the way, that it's the longest acting United Nations organization. Ahead of this centenary, where the ILO knew that they wanted to make a big global declaration on the future of work, that they wanted to bring governments together to think about those changes in the world of work, the ILO decided to, of course, run uh, processes at country level um, where they consulted governments on what the future of work meant for them. But they also created a global commission on the future of work, a global commission was founded in 2016 with 24 members, 
Two members, by the way, were from South America. It's Claudia Cortin from Brazil, and of course, Rebecca Greenspan from Costa Rica. Among those 28 members was also one representative from the private sector, and that happened to be my boss, right? So um, I'm telling you this because we were heavily involved in what then became that report from the ILO Global Commission on the Future of Work to the governments on what that future of work should look like, what should be in those recommendations on the future of work. In those recommendations and in that report, which by the way initially was 300 pages and I said we refuse so, and now it's 40 pages, so could be a nice weekend read for you. We said, well, there are two main things and that they're currently dictating the policy thinking around the world on jobs. One is we need to have a human-centric approach to work and to work um, policy and, and regulation. And you say, isn't this obvious? Shouldn't it always be human-centric? Well, maybe just to simplify, it used to be system-centric. But now it's really about putting the human first and then from there declining what you're going to do. It's actually a massive shift. We have that since 2019. And the other thing, ladies and gentlemen, what did they have in this report from the ILO Global Commission? What did they say the world needs? A new social contract for the world of work. So because we were so incredibly involved in the setup you know, of this thinking, we said, actually as the ADECO group, and as World Employment Confederation, we said, okay, you know what? We need to now define what that new social contract is about, right? Now we're on the, over the Andes. It's these peaks that are coming now. What we said is the new social contract is actually exactly what it says. It's a contract. So obviously it picks up on the notion that Rousseau had back in 1760s, which says it's a way that members of a community commit around certain obligations, responsibilities, knowing that they also have rights and that they will receive something in return. And so we went ahead and we built a framework, a framework that looked at the expectations on the one hand side and the responsibilities on the other side. And it's the expectations and responsibilities of three stakeholders. Those stakeholders are, well, the workers. If you're talking about regulation in the world of work, you need to think about what the workers expect, but also what the workers are supposed to do. And I'll come to it now, it's gonna be one of the snippets. Those days where you know people think it's a free ride and the government is gonna just put things at your disposal, also called passive labor market policies. You know, you're unemployed and you just benefit for years. Well, how long can a country still afford that? I'd love to say they're over, but we're still seeing too many countries that have such a system. Now, actually, we know in many countries in South America, there isn't even a system, right, to support the unemployed per se. But just the notion again here, coming back to the new social contract. It's about the individual also understanding that you have a responsibility to play in this whole piece, in this you know, world of work and future world of work. So we've got the individuals, the workers, we've got well business, obviously, and we've got the governments, right? Now, I purposely didn't bring a slide and whatever, but we actually, we built the framework. This is what it looks like, right? So we've got the expectations, and we've got the responsibilities, and we've got the layers. We've got the workers, the businesses, and the governments. And we're laying out in there what everybody should be doing. Again, I will be delighted to share that with you. But here are the snippets. And I'll start with, because this is a business encounter, I'll start with the expectations of the employers. We heard it today. But you know, it's interesting, nobody's ever thought about actually putting it down again in the context of what a framework should look like. In the context of the expectations that uh, there is a complexity out there and that we just need to also be able to reduce that complexity. So the expectations of companies 
And again, it might sound obvious. One, it's to have access to a diverse pool of candidates which have the relevant hard and soft skills and that boost productivity. How obvious does it sound? Well, believe it or not, many governments are still not aiming their labor policy towards that goal. They don't. Number two, expectation of employers. They need the pro-growth regulatory environment that incentivizes job creation and reflects the need for flexibility. Again, they need ease of contracting. They need the possibility to contract diverse forms of work, right? You want to have uh, contract workers, temporary workers, obviously your full-time employees. You want to have project workers, etc. Well, as a government, make sure that companies can access that. You want to be sure that there is that ecosystem for businesses. Number three, what employers expect is, well, trustworthy and stable institutions and authorities. I think this one we don't have to say much more about. But again, how much are we and has in the recent years actually been invested in that one? Now let's come to the responsibilities that employers have. Here, we say first, they need to focus on the sustainable employability of their staff. And here it's really about sustainable employability. Because what we say is that they really need to make that shift, and this is fundamental for Latin America as well, that you need to invest in your workforce. And when we talk about the ROI, which we do in this context, we talk about the return on individual. We say to businesses, look in the mirror, and you know exactly, you don't have the access to the talent that you need. Well, it's also because you're not investing in it. And for you, it's sometimes easier to just, you know, say goodbye to people instead of actually investing in them. Second responsibility of businesses is to provide inclusive and decent work for all, regardless of their contract and their workplace. And this is again also about, well, don't just in a way focus on your full-time employees. Yes, they're key, but you're actually smarter if you think about your entire workforce as it is, and if you invest in all the people that are connected to your workforce. And you must make sure, of course, to provide, well, flexible forms of working that reflect the needs of today. And the last piece on the responsibility side is embed sustainability and social impact commitments in the DNA of the company. We've heard talk about that today. And so here I can confirm to you that we are out there as an industry talking to our stakeholders and you know, putting this into a framework, putting this into uh, regulatory uh, pieces that are being written about labor legislation. Now let's come to the individuals. They have expectations. What do they expect? Well, they expect active training and career support from governments and businesses so that they can realize their own labor market aspirations, right? Fair enough. I think we can all sign that. They expect the ability to organize work safely and flexibly, and they expect to have their voice heard. This has been very interesting for us because we revised this. We built this framework in 2019, but of course COVID hit. And so we analyzed very closely what happened with COVID. And one thing we saw is that there is this need for everybody to speak out and to be recognized in terms of your own individual opinion. And we know that this is going to be much more important going forward for businesses, but also for governments. And by the way, to me, that's going to be one of the big challenges for the tripartite system in the world. And I'm maybe a bit technical, but the way policy, and in my case, labor policy is being drafted is by having governments, employers, and representatives of workers who happen to be trade union representatives. We have an issue, though, with that representativity. And knowing that workers want their voice to be heard, we need to find ways of having that voice included into the policymaking process as well. The third expectation that individuals have, ladies and gentlemen, what is that? What expectation do you have as workers? 
Yes, income security, fair remuneration for formal work, and then smooth labor market transitions. This is jargon. But if you are ready to change job or you're being asked to change jobs, well, make it easy for me. Don't make it bloody hard on me, right? Government, don't make it even more impossible for me to again become a valuable member of this economy and to um, make a contribution to productivity and growth. Government, make it easy for me and you company as well. If you don't know how to do this, well, guess what? There's companies like the private employment services industry that will help you do that. There is no reason in the world today, in the year 2022, why labor markets shouldn't work smoother. There's no reason why there are these high levels of unemployment. There's no reason why people cannot access labor markets. These are all political decisions. I'm sorry to break the news. I know it's shocking, but that's what it is. And actually, one of my big messages is depoliticize labor markets. As long as those are political, and again, how long can countries still allow themselves to go along political lines when it comes to deciding how many people and which people should be working. So anyway, those were the expectations of the individuals. Now, now comes a part that I enjoy quite a lot, which is the responsibilities of the individuals, the workers. I alluded to earlier, one, it's about the skills. And there it's about taking ownership yourself as well. Taking ownership of your own employability and skills development through active career planning. Don't expect others to do this. Do this yourself. Again, if you don't know how to do this, well, come to us. That's perfectly fine. Two, make those social contributions so that you can then also benefit. There's a lot of people who are on the sides, and this is a big discussion in the policy world right now when it comes to the gig economy and when it comes to the whole... Um, 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 contract work uh, conversation. Well, people need to be ready to obviously make their contribution and pay uh, their social security dues as well. And then, towards companies, be an engaged and productive collaborator, ready for more flexible career choices. Because you also have to recognize that for many companies, times are difficult. It is not an environment anymore where things are just straightforward and you've got that nine to five job. No, so accept it as well. I'm coming to the governments, and we're now going to start our descent. Well, governments expect a business engagement and investment in training and skilling. I mentioned it here. So you can see how things are interconnected. Governments also expect fair contributions for sustainable social protection systems. And finally, governments expect that active engagement in sustainable business behavior. When it comes to the responsibilities, here comes to the, to the link, here comes the link to that skilling part. And we know the agenda is huge. The entire sector is very active when it comes to facilitating solutions for training and upskilling, when it comes to building the system so that companies can go and work with government to upskill and reskill uh, to support that employability for all workers. Governments need to enable diverse forms of work. And lastly, governments need to ensure portable social protection and include transition support and other active labor market policies. Ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seatbelts because we are landing. I've taken you on this journey and I appreciate it. It was probably for many of you abstract, but what the intention was today is to showcase that what many um, stakeholders talk about in terms of the complexity to actually bring things forward and how to start um, introducing a thinking around, in this case, building that labor market that is needed to sustain companies and to ensure a country's competitiveness well, there, is, there are solutions on the table. There are solutions on the table. So from my perspective, I think the time has never been better 
for that new social contract in Latin America. Muchas gracias. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Um, so we are working for Swiss Life and we are working in employee benefits. So it's really interesting for us to hear uh, that. And I was uh, interesting to know from your uh, perspective if you think that any country in uh, Latin America you think is um, more ready for this new... Um, Social contract. Yeah. Uh, yes. If you already study that, and if you are, if you think that one country is more leader in this, look. In all fairness, this concept as it is is new, right? It was developed in 2019, and then COVID hit, as we know, and then we have readapted it. So, we have started conversations with certain parts of the administration uh, in uh, in Colombia, in Argentina, and in Chile. What we see is many countries have certain elements, yes. Um, Chile, actually, we're very encouraged. Uh, what we've just seen now is that um, Chile has uh, just signed an agreement based on um, uh, support, again, by the International Labour Organization to foster the cooperation between public and private employment services. Um, to look specifically at the employability piece, so to foster the role that our sector, that private employment uh, services companies can play in enhancing the employability of workers in Chile. And the focus here is quite heavily on young people and on women. I mean, men need it too, clearly. Um, but um, this has been a, a country with, uh, with encouraging signs. In Argentina, we've seen you know, there was an interest. We haven't seen an, an uptake. Currently, between us, there is quite uh, an upheaval in most countries uh, politically, as you know, with uh, changes of, uh, of government, um, where we also see that still labor market uh, topics do not have the, um, the level of priority on the political agenda that they should. So obviously we're completely biased, I can uh, confirm that. But what I like to um, put in front of people here is that on the one hand side, every president or head of state or uh, prime minister these days campaigns on one topic, which is jobs. That is the number one promise that every politician will make when she or he is campaigning. I will create all these jobs. Thanks to me, you will earn more. You will have a better life. And then the moment they get into government, they seem to forget. They seem to, of course, they remember. But then it's all these other policy uh, areas, of course, that are very important. We know that. There's one president in this world who the first measure he did, the absolute first thing he did when he came to power was the labor market reform. That was Emmanuel Macron seven years ago. Uh, France is a fascinating country, of course. But if you look at France's labor market, the biggest development the country has made is in labor market related issues. Of course, they still have structural, very interesting setups. Um, and now with the pension reform, we're going to see how that works. But France has introduced uh, one very interesting instrument. And it's actually also, that was going to be one of the canyons, which I didn't dive into. But what we're saying to countries, for example, is think about introducing an instrument which is called the individual learning account. So in France, it's called le compte personnel de formation. And you will be interested in the insurance and also the finance industry, because we're saying and maybe let me take the Swiss example. In Switzerland, there are three pillars that everybody in this country can take for uh, your personal, uh, what should I say? What's the word? I can't think of the word. That a company 
your safety environment, right? So you've got the first pillar uh, with a pension, which is the obligatory one, the second pillar, which is linked to your employer, or you can pay into if uh, you are self-employed. There's a third pillar, of course, which is voluntary. Now, what we're saying in Switzerland, for instance, is set up a fourth pillar. And that fourth pillar is about financing of training for each and every person in Switzerland. Because we will all need re and upskilling even in this country. Everybody around the world, and now coming back to other countries and to South America, think about how to finance or the instrument of financing that employability. And that's one of the key pieces we have in the social contract is it's going to cost you money, of course. But again, if you bring it down to the individual and you create that individual learning account, so everybody uh, either gets a yearly um, credit, let's say, for that personal account, where let's say in Singapore they do that. Every Singaporean every year gets 500 Singapore dollar. After 10 years, you have $5,000. That's exactly the moment you might need your first um, re-enough skilling. It might not be enough to finance the whole thing, but at least it's $5,000, right? And then you can go, you justify you're taking that money to re-enough skill, and there you go. This cannot be so tough, right? So these are the type of conversations and thinking we have, which again, we have framed within what we call the new social contract but which is part of what uh, the sector that I have the pleasure to represent are defending on a daily basis when it comes to labor market policy. We hope for the benefit of all of us um, and uh, for the benefit of all the companies represented here. Please. I have a question regarding uh, trade unions and how you involve them, because of course they're supposed to represent workers. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I think of trade unions in Latin America, I think of extremely bureaucr uh, bureaucracy, politicized, uh, and uh, even corruption. No? So how, how was dealing with, with trade unions and how, how we would you suggest for the future of work that trade unions could, could work better? Thank you. Okay, it's the easy questions. Um, <laughs> let me see, um, again, the, the way the world of work has been built so far, um, absolutely needs the trade unions as an organization, uh, and therefore, we do our utmost to have the best possible um, relationship with union representatives. That works very well sometimes because they're wonderful people. Huh? I mean, I'm, don't wanna, I'm, I'm generalizing here. I know you're generalizing as well. Um, there are situations where, of course, behind closed doors, we will actually find ourselves talking the same language. Um, but there's a lot of situations where um, the divergence of, uh, of interests is, is actually becoming more and more problematic, I would say. So um, I go from the assumption that everybody has the same interest of um, uh, building, and this is a bit uh, pathetic maybe, but building uh, you know, a good future and again, uh, providing opportunities for everybody. Um, but I'm, I'm sometimes wondering if that is the case. So we need to, that needs to be addressed, but it's the golden elephant in the room. Nobody, nobody is addressing that one, right? So we're really um, perpetuating a system that actually I don't think is, uh, is the most efficient. Since we're amongst friends, I can say that I'm also the vice uh, president of the OECD, uh, business at OECD Employment, Labor and Social Affairs Committee. Um, and I brought, I brought this specific topic into that space because I said we cannot continue. And in general, you know, today's labor markets were built after the Second World War in Europe. Um, and for sure, 30, 40, 50 years ago. How can, this, how can these frameworks be valid? You know, how can they be efficient today? So we need to have the courage to look at you know, those new ways of, um, 
of bringing labor market policy to the table. And there, that topic is, to me, one of the key topics. And again, as I said, there are ways today of bringing the worker voice to the table, um, which are not necessarily trade unions, but then uh, it is actually just not being seen as representative. So we have an issue there. So I'm a diplomat's daughter, I was a diplomat myself, and that's one of those more black and white uh, answers, I guess, but yeah. What a pity, I'm enjoying it here. <laughs> um, I would like to ask you about Mitbestimmung. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe many people probably in this room don't know what Mitbestimmung is, but in Germany this is a, um, uh, the, the, the representatives of the employees um, are on the boards. Why do you think, I mean, I think Germany, as far as I know, is really the only country that does this systematically. Why do you think this, what do you think about the, mm -hmm. the Mitbestimmung and why do you think it hasn't gone to other countries? Great question, great question, I love it. Because I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan because it's really about including um, your own people, your, your workforce, right, into uh, the process. Per se, the thinking, I think, sees quite a lot of, um, a lot of uh, adept uh, around the world. Uh, then again, once you are in a business reality, in a business environment, a classical company is usually not set up this way, right? Um, but the features of, of more modern companies uh, clearly uh, pinpoint in that direction. So it's also about ownership. Um, um, beyond the classical uh, share uh, ownership that we know, uh, again, in, in, in most companies. So uh, a very interesting one, and maybe just there's actually been some, some interesting research around which companies now in Germany, again, because you're right, there is just embedded in the, in the culture, right? Der Betriebsrat, as, as they say, uh, le comité, um, the works council, actually, uh, Comité d'entreprise. Um, so there's been an interesting research of w which companies fared better during the COVID crisis. And it seems like it's those companies that have the, a good, well-working uh, Betriebsrat, right? Because it's also not always uh, very efficient. But those uh, businesses have been able to do the best. Why? Because if they needed to reduce um, uh, workforce, for example, where that could be discussed in, in that environment and therefore uh, uh, it was more, more peaceful in a way and there was more social uh, stability around it. Thank you very much. What a powerful way to end this official program. Thank you, Always. Bettina, for your dynamic and encouraging and very um, imaginative uh, message. It was great to have you with us. And we have a, sp a small present for you as well. Oh, I was looking forward to that ever since I saw it. And we can so uh, give another round for applause. Thank you. Thank you. So we are almost uh, done with our official program. Thank you for all your questions and for being such a wonderful audience. And I also want to uh, thank my uh, ad hoc team, the welcome staff, Sunerat, Elena, Stefania, Paula, and Martina for being uh, so great today. Thank you very much. And I am now handing over to our Vice President, Linda Walker von Grafenried for the closing remarks. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Dear friends, we have reached the end of a dense and enriching afternoon. I hope you all have profoundly enjoyed listening to our speakers and felt inspired by their presentations and testimonials. I must say that I myself was very impressed by all the bilateral um, chamber members who stuck to the two minutes just like that. That was really incredible to see how well you all prepared and, and it was a good message that you got across to all of us. Once again, thank you to the contributors of this program um, and our patrons, the team from SGE, the Swiss Chambers, and of course, Tatiana. Thank you, Tatiana, once again, and your team.
Uh, before we move on to enjoying the delights of the aperitif riche, I would like to mention a few issues. All of you have received last week the invitation to our upcoming high profile event on September 21st. Uh, actually, um, Bettina mentioned the OECD. We're having a dialogue with Angel Goria, former Secretary General of the OECD, and as Cecilia knows, former um, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Mexico, actually the first Mexican ever to be president of the OECD. And he was actually, for three terms, um, the president of the OECD, and I think he did a fantastic job. Um, our honorary ambassador, Dr. Philippe Nel, will moderate the dialogue, which will be followed by a networking lunch and the opportunity to meet Mr. Magoria. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, we hope that all of you will join us for this event, which is hosted by our patron, Swiss Re. Um, if you have seen, not seen this yet on, uh, in the program, you can scan the, your QR, the QR code at our welcome desk and see the details of the website. I also want to make you aware that we have been thinking about a relaunch of what many of you still remember as the Junta Joven. And actually, Gregor Schmidt, Gregor, would you like to stand up? Gregor was uh, president at one stage of the Junta Joven. Um, and the reason that LATCAM wants to remain attractive for young professionals, students who have a strong interest in Latin America. We have a small list of persons who are interested in getting involved so that our first online brainstorming and exchange will take place in the coming weeks. If you know of students, academics, or young professionals who would like to, to participate in these activities and contribute time and ideas to such an initiative, then please ask them to contact us best by email. And any, if anybody's here tonight, to meet with Gregor and myself afterwards to brainstorm with Gregor because he has all the experience. He did this for I don't know how many years, but <laughs> and I'm sure he enjoyed it as well, right, Gregor? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, I have the regret to say goodbye to one of my fellow board members. Many of you know Manfred Ebling. For three years, he has represented Zurich Insurance on the LATCAM board, fulfilled the function of treasurer, and contributed to the virtual exchanges of the executive committee. He was a great support, and we all came to appreciate his clear opinions and well-crafted ideas. Manfred re recently stepped down from the board of LATCAM as he embarked on a new career path. We wish Manfred all the best for his future and do not want him to go without giving him a huge round of applause. Where's Manfred? Come on up, Manfred. And we have a small uh, gift and... Gracias a ti. Manfred, you can't go without giving me a gift. No. <laughs> Um, I now invite you all to stay on uh, for the network and enjoy the food and drinks, and especially to enjoy all of this tremendous um, group of people, especially the ones that have come all the way from Latin America. I'm sure we're going to have a lovely evening, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>